Welcome back to Movies TV Mad. You can follow me on Twitter at Movies TV Mad. And a very warm welcome to Monday's edition of the DC Universe and Everything Else Daily. And on today's show, we discuss Shazam's box office potential. And if it is a flop, like we're hearing it is going to be a flop, does it even matter? Does it matter if any of this year's DCEU movies are flops? I'll, ask, I'll, I'll answer that question shortly. Then we're going to review the Last of Us season finale, and I'll give you a little bit of a spoiler and a disclaimer. I loved it. Then we'll be talking about the Oscars, the 2023 Academy Awards. We've had that as well. It's another woke disaster. And if you stay to the end of the video, I have got an exclusive on Indiana Jones 5. Yes, an exclusive that you won't be hearing anywhere else. I know it. He was a big star tonight in tonight's Oscars. So that's very exciting if you like that kind of thing. But we will get into that. So stay to the end of the video. Or... If you're that way inclined, you can just fast forward to the end of the video. But please don't. Smash a like. Let's get into this. So you should be able to view my Shazam! Fury of the Gods non-spoiler review now. So go check it out after this video. Of course, I think I've been very fair to the film. But projections say that this movie will open up way below what the original film, the original Shazam, opened up to. That, my friends, is a disaster for Warner Brothers Discovery, but it's not going to be a shock to them. These kind of projections prove that James Gunn is right to create a new timeline, to start again. Yes, I'm very well aware that he will be dragging his own Suicide Squad and Peacemaker Universe into the new timeline. He created it. You don't mould something with clay, then screw it up and say, well, no, I better just start again, if you like what you've moulded. Look, the Suicide Squad may have been a flop, but it's a very good flop. And Peacemaker wasn't a flop. To the Snyderverse stands that keep on saying, oh, he's going to be making dick jokes in a Superman movie. Let me give you a quote from Man of Steel, a film I, of course, adore. When you're done measuring dicks, by Lois Lane. That's what Lois Lane says as a gag in Man of Steel. So I don't want to be hearing Snyderverse stands with their fake propaganda criticising James Gunn about making dick jokes when there's one in Man of Steel, you bloody hypocrites. Anyway, let's continue with this conversation. So it's going to be a disaster financially. There's no question about that. Ironically so, one of the people to blame for this, The Rock, was at this year's Academy Awards, he was asked about the critics' reviews and reactions to the Black Adam movie. He said all we could do is get the best people to make this film and make uh, and put our you know, best foot forward when he was asked about Henry Cavill's Superman being fired. Um, and he basically had this analogy, a football, an American football analogy, and talking about when a quarterback changes or when a, a coach changes or something. Literally, he's been fired. He admitted he's been fired at the Oscars, and they're going with somebody else. I believe we're going to get a new Shazam eventually, and the new Black Adam, a comic book accurate Black Adam. Because whether you liked The Rock, whether you enjoyed the film Black Adam, that isn't a comic book accurate Black Adam. We start again, this is another great decision by James Gunn. So Shazam pretty much potentially flopping at the box office proves that James Gunn is right to start again. Now, some of you will... Now, I mean, people keep on saying to me, yeah, well, James Gunn's universe is going to flop as well. You don't know that. You can't tell the future. You're not fucking Nostradamus. We don't know if it's going to fail. You don't know what he's going to do. He may do something amazing. His slate so far is amazing. Calling it Gods and Monsters is amazing. 
So, so far, it looks good and it looks like it's going to succeed. People are not supporting DC Extended Universe movies. It's done. It's over. But I'm going to watch all of these movies and I think I'm going to enjoy them. Despite them probably, maybe, not probably, but potentially failing at the box office. Warner Brothers Discovery have high hopes for the Flash movie. If that was to fail as well, wow, what a terrible year for them. But we've discussed this before. Superheroes are no longer the trend and only really, really good superhero movies are going to make bank. The MCU can no longer guarantee a big box office just because the MCU brand is at the beginning of a film. You make a great MCU movie, people will go and see it. So that's going to be interesting. The Blade, starring, how do you say his name? I can't pronounce the guy's name. Marshall Ali, is it Marshall Ali, right? Now he's made lots of demands. They had to go back to basics and start again. Apparently they're gonna start filming in June. Here's a little prediction on that movie. The star of that film will quit before that film is done shooting. They're either going to have to cancel that film altogether or recast. Marvel Studios don't have the talent to make a great, a great Blade movie. End of story. So I think we can say that Shazam! Fury of the Gods will do well critically, I think. Um, but the box office, it doesn't look encouraging. My man Rewind the Times, one of our subscribers here at Movies TV Mad, told me on a premiere for the Shazam! Fury of the Gods review, uh, non-spoiler review, that where he's living, there's, you know, the, the, the movie theatre, the, you know, the Odeon is empty. And there's only about seven tickets being bought or something like that. And I think this is going to be the situation all the way round. People know it doesn't matter about these movies anymore. And unfortunately, this is the way people view movies now. They, they're not interested in just going to view a brand or an IP for that movie. It's about the future. It's about the next five or six movies. I'm afraid that's what Kevin Feige has done to this industry. It's hugely damaging to movie theatres, it's damaging to brands and studios, and I think it's damaging to the fans who look at films this way as well. But ultimately, it really doesn't matter to James Gunn if Shazam flops. It doesn't matter to James Gunn if The Flash flops. Yes, that film sets up his new timeline, but that film's going to be seen by some, at least, and people are going to see how it works, right? So the important thing to James Gunn is, is Waller, you know, and, you know, Creature Commandos, and, you know, the, you know, and then away from his universe next year, it's the Penguin and the Joker movie as well. So another big year for DC. But we're moving away from the DCEU one way or another. Um, and I think there'll be more honesty about moving more away from the DCEU leads as well next year after these movies have all been released. Thus far, he said every lead of this year, of this year's um, DC releases has a chance to be involved in the future. He's only saying that to hype up the release of these movies because, you know, as a studio, they need them to do well. Financially, Shazam! isn't going to do well. But why is Shazam! Fury of the Gods potentially going to open up lower than the first film? I think that's a very interesting question because people liked the first film. I think Black Adam damaged Shazam so badly. The Rock damaged Shazam so badly. Again, my boy Rewind the Times complaining and asking me if, the, if Black Adam is mentioned in Shazam Fury of the Gods. I'm not giving away any spoilers because it's not fair on other people who don't want to be spoiled on that movie. And, you know, he's speaking about Black Adam should not should have been in Shazam! Fury of the Gods. That is The Rock's fault, my friend, right? Whether that happens or not, or he's mentioned, that is The Rock's fault. He didn't want to be involved with Shazam. He didn't want Shazam to cameo in the Black Adam movie. This is all The Rock's fault. This is all Hamada's fault. This is all Emmerich's fault for listening 
to that nut job, The Rock. And for the people who say, oh, but he brought Henry in, he tried, you know, total credit to him, he only did it to uplift his own movie, not to restore the Snyderverse and not to bring back Henry. They all lied to us to upscale that movie, including Henry, The Rock, the studio, all of us. And, you know, for people shitting on James Gunn, there's one thing we can say about James Gunn. He's not a liar. James Gunn is straight with the fans. He's always been straight with the fans. And when you're straight with the fans, sometimes you have to tell people things they don't want to hear, regrettably. But he doesn't lie. But the rest of them lied. So we're getting a new broom, sweeping clean. But some of that dust is going to be left behind in terms of Joker, the Batman, which I'm totally cool with, actually. And by the way, the Batman was done dirty on tonight's Oscars, or if you're in America last night, or whenever this video goes out, it doesn't really matter, right? The Batman was done dirty. It's cinematography, some of the best I've ever seen. No cinematography isn't VFX, isn't CGI, it isn't computer-generated images. It's proper camera work, which is what you get from Matt Reeves in The Batman, but talent from a white director isn't rewarded these days. We'll get into it when we talk about the Oscars. I hated this year's Oscars. I, I thought it was a total charity event. We'll get into it. I don't, I don't think you can be surprised about my attitude about that. So ultimately, everyone, the moral of this story in terms of Shazam, Fury of the Gods, and, you know... And again, I'm, I'm blaming The Rock for the Shazam portion of the DCEU in terms of Black Adam and both Shazam movies and how much they made. And Shazam didn't make a lot of money either. It's only the fact that Shazam cost under $100 million to make that it actually made a profit. Or it would have been a disaster for that movie. Unfortunately, they made the mistake of injecting a more of a budget in Shazam Fury of the Gods. Because if Shazam Fury of the Gods was as cheap to make as the first film, it would have made a profit again. And maybe they could have got away with it. Now, there is a magic box office number um, at Warner Brothers and most studios where films automatically get sequels and stuff. It's a bit different now because James Gunn wants to go down a different direction. So China is going to be very, very important. Um, China is always very, very important in terms of box office. And it's something that Black Adam didn't have, because if it did have it, I think it would have cleared 500 million and it may have had a future. Maybe Henry Cavill would have had a future, but it wasn't big enough money. They did spend a lot of money on Black Adam and Black Adam's marketing campaign had a huge budget. It was huge. He was going everywhere to rock. He couldn't keep his mouth shut, could he? So, yeah, and he was promising things he couldn't deliver, like Henry Cavill's Superman in the future which was absolutely wrong, as I've already said. They lied to you to upscale that movie. But Shazam! Fury of the Gods has got China. It has got that country on their side. So that, it all really depends how well it does in China. Now, Star Wars, you may not know this, Star Wars never does that well in China under George or under Disney. It's just not popular over there. I don't think it's even ever been banned over there. I could be wrong. Definitely not George's ones. Anyway, so China, though, loved DC, and China predominantly have loved the DCEU. But the problem is for this movie, because it's going to have a low domestic opening, and we don't know how well it's going to do globally, I think this is going to be very inconsistent in terms of box office. And what I'm talking about is I think it will do better in some countries than it would do in others. I think it will do quite well in the UK. I think people on social media there seem to be saying they're definitely going to support it. Less people will support it in the US. I don't, I don't know why. Why? Could Shazam flop? Well, I've seen the film and I can tell you it's a good time at the cinema. But I told you that Black Adam was a good time at the cinema and not everyone came out to see it. Black Adam, let's not get it twisted, has its issues, but it's a good time at the cinema. I mentioned Masters of the Universe starring Dolph Lundgren. I, as a kid, loved that film. But you can see why critics hated it. You can see why it didn't make the money. But it's not always about 
making the best technical movie and following all the rules of storytelling. Sometimes it's just about giving enjoyment to an audience. I love the He-Man animated series from the early 80s. He-Man, I have the power! That one, right? So I loved sitting there seeing it come to life. Like, you know, the Last of Us fans are, are enjoying, you know, gamers are enjoying watching the TV show. I don't play the game, but I've enjoyed the first series, although um, structurally I have had issues with it. But that finale was absolutely perfect. That is how you do a finale and wow, what's going to happen in season two. We'll get to it very, very shortly. So I'm saying to you that Shazam and Shazam Fury of the Gods are a great two movies. But what happened between the first film being popular and this film coming out is that it was supposed to be released a lot earlier. They should have released this film as close to the other film being released as possible. What I'm saying is this film could have been released and should have been released last year. Would it have made a difference? I don't know. I think James Gunn and everything he said about a brand new universe has also hurt this film. People know we're going down a different direction and that hasn't helped the situation. But what I'm saying is go and enjoy the movie, enjoy the rest of this year's DC movies, but ultimately they may not have much to do with the James Gunn and Peter Saffron era. That's okay because I'm old fashioned. I just want to go and watch a movie and enjoy it. I did it with Black Adam and I did it with Shazam Fury of the Gods. Now, all all directions point to the Flash movie. And in the next few weeks and months, we're going to be focusing a lot on that movie. I am excited for everyone to see that movie. Now, will that be successful? That's a movie that has to be successful because if it's not, questions will definitely be asked and fingers will be being pointed to because Zaslav has gambled everything on this movie. Now, he wasn't involved in green lighting this movie or funding this movie, but he made the decision to keep Ezra Miller in that movie, to not shelve that movie. Now, I don't know how much he would have got for a tax write-down, but it would have been a considerable amount of money considering how much it cost them. Now, he's gambled that they can make a lot more money in profits by releasing this film. What's on that film side? Michael Keaton, Michael Keaton, Michael Keaton. That's what people are excited about. So let's see if that uplifts the movie. Now let's get into The Last of Us Season 1 finale. I have never played the game before. I'm not a big gamer, although I do play Mario Kart and FIFA and things like that. So I've never played this game. So I went into this game just kind of thinking this is a zombie apocalypse drama. It will be interesting. Straight away, I questioned the structure of this show. You see, the thing is, with, with this guy, Neil Drunkman, he's a game developer, and he doesn't have the experience of writing drama itself. You're saying, Mick, what is the difference? Well, the difference here is, everyone, that you've got to structure television or film in a different way. Let's talk about episode three before we get into the finale. Episode three focused the whole episode on two random characters and their same-sex relationship. It was a romance. It was beautifully done. It worked. I loved it. There's no issue with it being about, you know, a same-gendered couple. I don't care about that. But what you did was you took a whole episode away from Joel and Ellie. So already, we're not getting to know them in the early parts of the season. I don't like that structure. I come from great shows like Lost and The Walking Dead, where they did a lot of char character work on Rick, and, you know, and his wife and his kid, you know, and Daryl and all of those characters early season one. Well, here we kind of dive into episode three and we distract the way from Joel and Ellie. And lots of people say to me, oh, I love Joel and Ellie, I'm going to miss them. But I don't feel like any of this has been earned. And in a, in a way, it's interesting, maybe really this, what happens in the season finale finally earns that relationship, but they haven't built it up enough because there's been too many distractions. But after episode three, they certainly focused on Joel and Ellie, and that's worked. Now, to the season one finale. I loved it. The stakes are high. 
This is a spoiler chat. So if you don't want to know what happens in The Last of Us, switch off now and come back after you've seen the episode. This is all about Joel. This is Joel's episode and Pedro Pascal is absolutely blistering brilliant. Even the badly written Maxwell Lord in Wonder Woman 84, he actually made that character interesting with his performance. He can make any bad writing look good. But this episode wasn't badly written. It was very well written. And, you know, if you, if you have seen the episode, you'll know what happened. So at the beginning, being, beginning of the episode, we actually see Ellie's mum give birth to her. It's a brilliant scene. We even see her cut the umbilical, um, umbilical cord. She's been bitten by a zombie. She's going to die. She's going to kill herself. Then she's interrupted and she gets her friend to do it for her. So basically we find out how Ellie comes into the possession of that woman whose name escapes me. This is why I should never review stuff, right? But anyway, so we have that backstory. Then we go to present day and Ellie seems very, very somber because they're going to the hospital. They're going, to, basically this was the mission for Joel to hand her over to this hospital so they can experiment on her and find out if she can be used as a cure for this virus. So what happens is when they get there, they basically Joel is told because he's knocked out when he first gets there, he wakes up and they tell him they need something from her brain, which basically means they're going to kill her to extract something. I can't remember the medical terms. Joel has already lost the daughter. Joel goes absolutely nuts. They try and escort him off the premises. He fucking kills everyone, and I mean everyone, including the surgeons. He doesn't even spare them, not just shooting them in the leg. He shoots some in the leg, then blows their fucking brains out. This is a brutal moment, and he takes Ellie. But the thing is, if you go back a bit, before they operate on Ellie, they tell Joel that they haven't actually told her that they were going to kill her, to extract whatever they were going to extract. So that's very, very unfair as well. Now, prior to them getting there, Joel was kind of hinting to Ellie about them not going at all. And she really, really wants to help. She wants to do it. But let's make one thing absolutely clear. She didn't know that she was going to have to die to do it. Because she says, after that, we can go and do anything you want. So he abducts her. She wakes up. And by the end of the episode, you know, because he tells her that everyone died because there was an attack. He doesn't tell her the truth that he wiped them all out to save her life. She makes him swear he's telling her the truth. He swears. He lies to her. My prediction is, and I've never played the game, a reminder again, I think because of this lie that Ellie may end up killing Joel. Watch this space. Really looking forward to season two. I somehow think we may not even see it next year. We may have to wait a couple of years. I'm not sure because next year is House of Dragons. I think they may alternate those two shows on HBO Max and HBO in general. But it was a very, very good season finale. It's the kind of season finale I want to see. And it makes up for a lot of my misgivings I had during the season. It was very well structured. It really resonates in the relationship between Joel and Ellie. These are two very different people from two different worlds. Now, Joel has killed a lot of people before meeting Ellie. But when he was a dad, he was a good man, a good dad. But the death of his daughter broke him. And this would happen to any parent out there. Ultimately, I agree with what Joel did. And that may be somewhat controversial, to some of you, maybe all of you, but children, our children, and I'm not a father, but I've got 10 nieces and nephews. And if I was put in the same position for any of my nieces and nephews, I would have done the same thing. If your child's life is in jeopardy, you would have done what Joel did. Now you can talk to me until you're blue in the face about him being selfish and him basically stopping the world getting a cure. That basically is 
his adopted daughter now. That's how he sees her. He's already lost a kid. He doesn't want to lose another kid. So some people are going to start judging Joel and thinking he's a part of toxic masculinity. No, he's a dad. Maybe he went over the top murdering them all and not just injuring them, but they would have come after him. So he wiped them all fucking out to protect, to protect his adopted daughter. So I agree with Joel. So it was a fabulous episode. Pedro Pascal is class. Make no mistake, whether you agree with his stances in real life, that doesn't matter. We're talking about him as an artist. What an artist does in reality, I couldn't give a shit, right? This is about the talent. That is Pedro Pascal. And um, he's brilliant. And he's brilliant in this episode. And this episode is all about him. Now, Neil Drunkman has confirmed that, uh, is it, Bella Ramsey will reprise her role as Ellie in season two. She's not being recast unless she ever decides to quit. I don't know where these conversations are even coming from. Now, I know some of you gamers are triggered by her casting, but you can't deny she's a multiply talented young person. They are a great actor. They are brilliant. I love Bella. I've loved Bella since her monologue on Game of Thrones. And this is a fabulous episode. And I really enjoyed it. Bring on season two. And as I said, remember who said it first. I think Ellie will kill Joel for what he did and for lying to her. So it'll be very interesting if that actually happens. Now, let's talk about the Academy Awards of 2023. What an absolute shit show. This year's Academy Awards became a charity event. They gave Brendan Fraser the charity, the charity award for best actor. Well, it might as well be called a charity award. Now listen, he acted his pants off, but basically everything everywhere all at once swept the board and won everything. Now in any other year, the Elvis movie directed by the fabulous, one of the best directors of all time, Baz Luhrmann, cleans up. Basically, the guy playing Elvis should have won Best Actor. Austin Butler should have been Best Actor because he was the best actor there. Yes, better than Brendan Fraser's performance. Baz Luhrmann should have won for Best Director. He is a better director than the guys who directed everything, everywhere, all at once. Basically, an afternoon matinee level of a fucking movie. Elvis should have also won Best Picture, Best Soundtrack, and I don't know if it did. I don't think that it did. But basically, one of the most disgusting awards of tonight is Tony Curtis's daughter, that's how I'm going to refer her to, that's why she's even successful, Jamie Lee Curtis literally won the award for Best Supporting Actress over Angela Bassett. Now, that is absolutely disgusting. Now, in a way, I'm kind of happy that a Marvel actor didn't win the award, but Angela Bassett is a fabulous actress. She played Tina Turner years ago, did a great job there. She's one of the best actors on the circuit and her contribution to the industry cannot be questioned. And let's just compare acting talents between Jamie Lee Curtis and Angela Bassett. It doesn't actually measure up, does it now? So that's a disgusting decision. And let's be absolutely clear about this. The only reason Jamie Lee Curtis wins supporting actress for everything, everywhere, all at once is so that fucking film can clear the board. It's a charity event. People are winning awards because they're coming from certain avenues. They tick certain boxes. That's why that film won. So they can go, oh my God, look at this. The first Asian actress to win Best Actress. But it's wrong, everyone. It's wrong on that level. Let's not get it twisted. Everything, everywhere, all at once is a brilliant film, but it's not brilliant enough to be winning everything at the Oscars. And the only reason it did is because it's an Asian movie. Now, let's give credit to let's give credit to where it's due. A24 produced that movie. A24 produced The Whale. They are dominating Hollywood and they make damn good movies and everything everywhere all at once is a great movie, but it's not a better movie 
than the Elvis movie, and let's not get that twisted. So, as I say, the whole thing was a charity event, tickle under my chin, kind of. It was a, basically, it was a padding of the ego of the woke community to say to Asian people, look, aren't we kind? Aren't we charitable? We're giving you all these awards because we used to be racist 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, but we're better now. Why does Brendan Fraser win the award? B because he was sexually harassed. And this is Hollywood's way of saying, we're really, really sorry, Brendan. We fucked you up. We psychologically damaged you. Here's an Oscar. This is how they apologize to people because they never take responsibility for the damage they do to these people. And that's my opinion on the Oscars. And finally today, I promised you an exclusive. Now, I forgot the actor's name. Yeah, I'm good at this, isn't I? But the actor who played Short Round, I think, won Best Supporting Male Actor. If I'm right, he won He won something. Anyway, For ev was it Everything Everywhere All at Once? Anyway, as a boy, he played Short Round in Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. That is my favourite indie movie. I don't know why so many people don't have preference to that movie, but I absolutely love it. I thought Kate Capshaw in that movie was great too. So here's a little exclusive, and I'm happy about this, by the way. Short Round will be in Indiana Jones 5. Don't tell everyone, because it's supposed to be a secret. I repeat, Short Round will appear in Indiana Jones 5. And I forgot the name. Is it the Dial of Destiny? Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. What a terrible title that is. I don't know if it's going to be a good movie or anything like that. I am not going to tell you how big his role is in the movie, but I can exclusively tell you that Short Round will be in the movie, and I couldn't be more happier about that. This has been the DC Universe and Everything Else Daily, Monday's edition of the show. It's been fully, you've had opinions, you've had updates. I hope you're satisfied with what you got from this show, and if you're not, tough. So please like, share, subscribe, hit the notification bell so you never miss this beautiful perfection, and I'll see you again in the next video. And do I see you again? Goodbye, au revoir, au revoir,